What do you think of when you hear the words messianic prophecy? Perhaps for some of you, your mind instantly goes to one specific passage of scripture, perhaps your favorite Old Testament passage, where you believe it clearly and specifically paints a picture of Jesus. Perhaps for others of you, your mind doesn't go to any one text in particular, but you feel relatively comfortable with the subject of messianic prophecy. You may not know where to find one, but well, you know it when you see it. For others of you, when I ask what do you picture or think of when you hear the words messianic prophecy, the only thing that comes to your mind is a big question mark. Because for you, this is a strange and confusing subject. Anytime people talk about it, you feel like maybe you're missing a key bit of information. Your preacher points out, hey, this is a messianic prophecy right here, and well, you just take his word for it. I don't know where you fall on this spectrum, but my guess is that most of us fall somewhere in between there. And over the course of the next several sessions, what I want to do is guide us deeper into this subject and into the depths of Scripture. In my opinion, Messianic prophecy uh, contains some of the most uh, rich and, and rewarding uh, moments in our study of the Bible. And my hope and prayer is that over the next several sessions, you will get some of the tools that you can use in order to study Scripture at a deeper level, as well as uh, have some tools available to lead you into a better understanding of Jesus as the Messiah. Ultimately, though, my hope and my prayer is that through these moments of study and even in your personal moments of reflection, you will be led to the very throne of God in worship. For me, some of the deepest moments of worship in my life have been those when I've sat with the scriptures open before me and realized God's sovereign plan throughout history. I pray that that is the reality for all of us as we walk through Messianic prophecy together. Let's begin then with what we think would be the very first Messianic prophecy. If I asked you, what is the first Messianic prophecy, what text would you think of? Usually, when I ask this question in class, people come up with all sorts of different ideas. But after a few minutes, usually uh, they all decide, yeah, yeah, I think this is the very first Messianic prophecy. And the text they often go to is Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. This text has been called by many the Proto-Evangelium, the first gospel. Genesis 3, 15 says this, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. People consider this to be the first messianic prophecy, the first place really in all of scripture where we have a very clear prediction of Jesus the Messiah. But I have some questions. First of all, are we sure this is a messianic prophecy? If it is, how do we know? I mean, it doesn't say the name Jesus. It doesn't even say the name Messiah. What about this makes us think it's a messianic prophecy? Well, perhaps the answer is in church history. Perhaps we need to look at the church fathers and people throughout the centuries. What have they interpreted as messianic prophecy? But I think if we think about this for too long, we have to realize that surely church tradition shouldn't be our authority for deciding what is messianic prophecy and what is not. Surely church tradition can help us as we begin to analyze messianic prophecy, but letting that be our authority, I think, is not the way we want to go. What else could it be then? Well, perhaps it's just the kind of consensus of modern Bible scholars. Perhaps that should be our authority. But I think we realize modern Bible scholars uh, surely cannot be the authority for telling us everything we need to know about God's word. Well, if it's not church history and if it's not Bible scholars, well, maybe it's just my preacher. Whatever my preacher says, that's what I believe. And while this might be well and good, and I'm 
not necessarily wanting to argue with your preacher. My guess is your preacher would argue with another preacher somewhere else. And if there's no consensus between all of the preachers on what messianic prophecy really is or what passages are messianic in nature, perhaps that's not the answer as well. It's a difficult question, and I would like for you really to wrestle with this a little bit, to try to understand what is it that I consider uh, factors that make for a messianic prophecy. Here's another question, though. What do we mean by the word messianic? Do we mean that there's a specific passage of Scripture that points in a direct way to the New Testament? Could it be that there's some sort of indirect messianic prophecy where it points in some sort of indirect way? Are there other ways that the Old Testament could be used in the New, perhaps different than what we would expect? How do we really know what a messianic prophecy is, and what do we even mean by the words messianic prophecy? prophecy. I think in order to help us along with this, we should go to another passage, Luke chapter 24. Here at the end of Luke's gospel, we find Jesus. He's lived his life. He's reached the end of his life. He's been arrested, tried, crucified, buried. And now where we pick up in Luke chapter 24, we find him uh, on a road. That morning, he had risen from the dead. We uh, see the women at the tomb, and they're very confused as to what they've seen. And two of the disciples, not of the original 12, but two of the others who follow Jesus, are walking on a road from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And I love this passage of Scripture. Jesus just kind of comes up and walks along right next to them. And as they're walking along, they see Jesus, but he is, he is, his appearance is kept from them so that they don't recognize that it's actually him. And he plays dumb, right? Well, what are you, what are you all talking about? They said, are you the only one in Jerusalem who doesn't realize what has happened these days? And they begin to tell him about Jesus and all that happened. But then listen to what Jesus says. Jesus says to them, O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe. See, he knew that they had read their Old Testaments. But even though they had read their Old Testaments, they had missed the Messiah. And so, beginning in the Old Testament, he began to unpack for them the truths of all of Scripture. I would have loved to be there on that road and hear Jesus walk through these passages. <clears throat> Finally, they reach the place where they're going. Jesus pretends like he's going farther, right? And so... They urge him, no, 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 come in, stay with us, eat dinner. And so he comes in, he eats dinner with him, he breaks the bread, and when he does, he is made known to them. Their eyes are open, and they realize this is Jesus himself. And then he vanishes. It's an incredible story. Immediately, they turn and run right back to Jerusalem. They want to let all the other disciples know what they have just experienced. They get back, they break into the room where all the disciples are gathered, they share with them all of these things, and then all of a sudden, Jesus himself appears again among them. And listen to what happens, Luke chapter 24, verses 44 and 45. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. These are the three major designations of the Hebrew scriptures. Verse 45, then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. I think there's two important things that we need to realize here. Number one, the early disciples knew their Old Testaments and they knew it well, but they missed the Messiah. And here's the second thing, they only understood it once Jesus revealed it. Now, perhaps at this point, we want to throw up our hands in resignation. Surely, if the early disciples missed it, there's no hope for us. But I wonder, what would those two who were walking on the road to Emmaus, what would they have done? What would those early disciples gathered there in the upper room have done once Jesus opened their minds to understand the Scriptures? 
would they not have over the course of the next several days and weeks and months and years reflected on those passages that Jesus had mentioned to them? Would they not have let those Old Testament passages of Scripture form and shape their Christology? In fact, I think what we find in the New Testament is the unpacking and the unfolding of Jesus' road to Emmaus sermon. And so, by studying the Old Testament quotations and allusions throughout the New Testament, I think we'll find ourselves as close as we can get to actually enrolling in Jesus' Principles of Interpretation course. And so, throughout the course of the next several sessions, this is what we will do. We will always start in the New Testament. We could start in the Old Testament, but we recognize so did the early disciples, and they missed Jesus. Instead, we will always start in the New Testament, trying to ask, what does the New Testament say, and what passages are the New Testament authors consulting and their understanding of Messianic prophecy? With this in mind, then, perhaps we can come back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where in the New Testament is this passage quoted or alluded to? I think there's just a handful of places where perhaps we could say Genesis 3.15 is in mind. But in my opinion, there's only one place in Scripture, maybe two. We'll look at the second one in our very last session together. But there's only one place, I think, where it's very clear and very specific that Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 is in mind. And that passage is in Romans. It comes at the very end, Romans chapter 16, verses 19 and 20. There was a children's song several years ago. Romans 16, 19 says, actually the song includes verse 20 as well, but well, that doesn't fit well into the cadence of the song. Anyway, Romans 16, 19, and 20. Maybe you remember it or have it memorized from that, but it goes something like this. Be excellent at what is good. Be innocent of evil. And the God of peace will soon crush Satan underneath your feet. Do you hear the similarities to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15? But there's a few important things that I think we need to notice about Romans 16, 19, and 20. A few pieces of this that are a little bit peculiar. First of all, <clears throat> notice that it is not the seed of the woman who crushes Satan, but rather it is God. The God of peace will soon crush Satan. Second, it's future tense. This is not something that has happened in the past, but rather it's something that will happen in the future. And then third, it is not the seed of the woman's feet under whom Satan will be crushed, but rather it is underneath your feet or underneath our feet. So my question is this. If Genesis 3.15 is the very first messianic prophecy, why do the New Testament authors seem to use it in a way different than what we would expect? I think the answer to this is actually to go back into the Old Testament to Genesis 3.15 and see if we can understand this a little bit better. Genesis 3.15 happens in a garden. God has created the world. He has placed in the garden man and woman in order to work and to serve. Also in that garden, he has planted a tree. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. While they are there in the garden, uh, working and keeping it, they're able to eat from any tree except this one. For in the day they eat of that, they will die. Well, Genesis chapter 3, we are introduced to a serpent. That serpent introduces chaos into the world. He tempts Adam and Eve, first Eve, right, with this question. He says, did God really say? How many temptations begin with those words, questioning the character of God? Did God really say? And then, as we move on from there, 
we find that Eve listens to the serpent. She takes of the fruit that he offers her. She gives it to her husband, Adam. He takes of it, and immediately they realize they are naked and they are ashamed. And so they hide in the garden from the presence of the Lord as he walks through the garden. God calls out to Adam, where are you? Where are you? And Adam replies, here I am. I hid because I was naked and I was afraid. God says, who told you that you were naked? He knows what they have done. And Adam, like a good man, right, stands up and takes responsibility. No, he doesn't, right? He passes the blame. Well, it's not my fault. It's this woman you gave me, right? Eve, what did you do? Well, it's not my fault. It's the serpent that you created. And so then God speaks to the serpent. The serpent doesn't get to respond. And God says to the serpent, I will curse you. Then he goes on to say, and I will put enmity between you and the woman. We could translate this word also as hostility. This is what is going to be between the, the woman and the serpent, between her offspring and him. And really, uh, Bruce Waltke calls this sovereign grace. There's this idea that God has allowed for, God has allowed for the, the offspring of the woman to live in tension with evil. Praise the Lord, right? That we cannot just uh, embrace evil, that there's always some sort of battle or tension. It goes on then, uh, as God continues to curse the serpent, right? He says, I will put hostility between your offspring and hers. But then he says, and he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. I think the NIV translates both of those words differently. What's going on there with this word strike, or perhaps we could say crush? In the original Hebrew, these are actually the same word. You will strike his head and you will, uh, and you will strike his heel. Why the same word and why does the NIV translate them differently? Well, I think the reality is this. When we're dealing with uh, a man, right, and striking a serpent, what, what happens when a man steps or strikes the head of a serpent or a snake. I think we all have to agree it probably crushes that snake. It's a potentially fatal blow. And what happens if a man is walking through a field and a snake or a serpent strikes at his heel? Well, probably that snake is a venomous snake. And if that happens, there's a very good likelihood that that man will in fact die. So, this is also a potentially fatal blow. Genesis 3.15, then, I think, paints a picture of both uh, hostility between the offspring of the woman and the serpent, but also an ongoing battle between them. There is no hint in Genesis 3.15 that the woman's offspring will be victorious. I think, instead, what we have is a picture a picture of life where there is a constant struggle between good and evil. Later on in Israel's history, they begin to write uh, different writings, right? We have the law and then we have uh, the section of the Hebrew scriptures actually called writings, right? The collection of Psalms and Proverbs and some of these other ones. Uh, one of the Psalms, Psalm chapter 91, reflects on the reality of living under the shelter of God. I want to take a moment and just look at this passage together. Psalm chapter 91. Psalm 91 uh, is really the record of a righteous man and what he believes life is like for him because he has chosen to shelter himself under the Almighty God. Psalm chapter 91 says this in verses 11 through 13. For he, that is God, will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. 
this passage, I think, is really the only passage in the Old Testament that actually develops this idea of Genesis 3.15. And I think what it is saying is this, the enmity or the hostility that began in the garden with the man and the woman and the serpent, this crushing now continues throughout the rest of life. However, for those who choose to align themselves with God, they will find that they are then able to crush the serpent underfoot. You may recognize this passage uh, from the pages of our New Testament, but it doesn't come from the mouth of Jesus. Instead, it comes from the mouth of Satan himself. When Jesus is being tempted in the wilderness, Satan actually quotes scripture. Psalm chapter 91, I think Satan knew which passage of, scrip of scripture talked specifically about him. And he's wanting to use those passages against Jesus to get him to sin. Anyway, I think what we find is that Psalm chapter 91 verses 11 through 13 picture this ongoing struggle between good and evil. But all of this struggle comes to a head in the person of the Messiah. This hostility is brought to a head specifically as Jesus is arrested, tried, and put to death. In this moment, all of the history of good and evil come crashing together as Jesus dies on the cross. And yet, in his death and resurrection, the seed of the woman is victorious and achieves for himself and for the rest of the woman's offspring, victory. So then, when we come to Romans chapter 16, verses 19 and 20, I think there's a few things for us to note. Remember how it starts. Be excellent at what is good. Be innocent of evil. Just like Genesis 3.15 we have the contrast between good and evil. We're right back in the garden, except Paul is urging his readers to be wiser than the woman. Then he goes on, and the God of peace. Well, where's hostility? Well, the hostility has been put to an end by the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And now it is no longer hostility, but rather the God of peace. He is the one who will soon crush Satan underneath your feet. I think what this passage is saying is that Genesis 3.15 is not simply a prediction of Jesus in the flesh, but rather is a picture of the ongoing struggle between good and evil. And now, because of what Jesus has done and the victory that he has attained, we, his church, can have life and victory over the evil one. In my opinion, Paul is using Genesis 3.15 in order to let us all know, as we move forward in the Christian life, we will find that God's plan is unfolded as we, because of the sacrifice of Jesus, trample on the head of the serpent. It is only because of Jesus' sacrifice that God will crush Satan then underneath our feet. So then this is what we will do as we move throughout the next several sessions. We will always start in the New Testament and then we will let that be our guide to the pages of the old. There's a probably apocryphal story of a missionary woman who spent several years teaching in a remote village in Africa. Towards the end of her time, as she was getting ready to leave, she began to let people know that she would not be there for much longer. She was going to be heading back home. And there, just before she was about to leave, one Young, one young boy, one of her students, came up to her and presented her with a gift. She opened it up and found it was a shell. Immediately she was taken aback because she knew that this remote tribe in Africa did not live anywhere near 
the beach or the shore. In fact, in order to get this shell, that boy would have had to make a three days journey to the nearest shore. And she cried when she opened the gift. Ah, this is, this is too much. And the little boy replied, but teacher, the journey is part of the gift. We could just read our New Testaments. But I think if we did, we would miss out on the picture that God has painted throughout history. And so, throughout these sessions, we will look at what the Old Testament has to say about Jesus, what it has to say about God's plan. And we will try to treasure, treasure these passages of Scripture that give us a picture of the Messiah. Because, after all, the journey is part of the gift.